Hey, uh, this is a question about the um, the lunch. You know, if you uh, if my my son normally brings lunch with him, Thank but you. when he forgets his lunch, we have to have money in the uh, the account the, the account because they won't take cash, and so and and if you put money in the account, you know, then you, then you have percentages left. Like I have, I think I have twenty five cents in there right now, and I get the notices, hey, you have twenty five cents, put more money in. Right. I don't want to put more money in because they charge me every time I put money into the right. account. Right. So I don't understand why we can't have a system that would allow cash or allow some sort of transaction where I can control it without having to pay to put money into a system for my kid to get lunch. Yep. Thank you for your question. That's a great question. It's a fair question, too. You know, we've done a lot of experimenting. We also know that, just to be candid, you know, uh, is Bill Roth here tonight? And Holly's here, right? Yep. Bill, our assistant head of the middle school and middle school dean, uh, he's been working with our food staff, and Holly has been a really big help, as has Todd. Um, and we know that there's some dissatisfaction with the students as well. We've tried hard to make the lines more efficient. We've added a second line. No, but that's helped because, you know, let's face it, if you only have so much time to eat and you can't get your food, why wait in line, right? So kids aren't, aren't dumb that way. I know many kids love the old fast food that we used to have, and uh, I really kind of made a decision that I just didn't think that was uh, in, their, in their best interest. Um, but, and, and many don't like the new food offerings that we have, just to be honest. But I, I do think it's healthier, and I do think that we're going to continue to work to improve that. As, as to your specific question about taking cash, a lot of that decision was based on the idea that it would make what is already a long line take even longer if kids are going for cash. But I, I wouldn't say to you that we would rule it out in the future as we improve our systems. And I'm, I'm taking note, we're videotaping as well, so I'm going to record your question. And Mr. Roth was here to hear it as well, too, so I'm sure he'll add it to his list of um, things Gioni to Gioni Teofilo, Hi, having Hi. children in the middle school and lower school, I applaud the healthier choices. I really appreciate that. So we, you know, we have our kids bring lunch and buy lunch as well. Great. In the lower school, it's wonderfully easy because the child orders with the teacher in the morning. My two in middle school, they have to like look at their schedule for the day and say, well, do I have time to stand in line? Tuesday and Wednesday, I may have time to stand in line. Is there a way to incorporate the, the efficient ordering that's done in, in lower school, like even online, and especially with the iPad rollout? I was thinking if there's an app on the iPads and middle or upper school students could just go ahead and order, and then I appreciate there may be a little bit of logistics, but if, you know, somehow, some way, the homeroom could have lunch in a certain spot ready to grab, those lines are tough. So it's great having the option of healthier food. I think we appreciate it, but it'd be wonderful if there would be a way to uh, minimize the lines for the middle and upper schools. Great, thanks, thanks for your question, Joni. You know, we have this opening for technology integrator. Are you looking for, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, actually, what I would say is that in the past few weeks, I, I hope that, uh, you know, I'm not far off here. I think in the past few weeks, if students are waiting in line, middle school and upper school, Lunch, if, if every, everyone doesn't necessarily have, you know, lunch is 45 minutes. Um, we've gotten the line down to 13 minutes, 14 minutes. Mr. Roth, tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, we've opened that second window. If, yeah, and so I'm hoping that that concern that the kids had earlier in the year, which was legit, believe me, I observed it, um, has uh, quieted down quite a bit. Um, but I love the idea of the iPads. Um, that one I hadn't thought of. So Mr. Roth is taking notes, and so is Holly. So, um, We'll, um, I, I'm gonna con we'll keep that under consideration. Anytime you can give kids more flexibility and more choice, um, it's still mass food, right? So you gotta have an idea of how much you need. And uh, we, we do tell the food service company to make sure plan for overages, but they have a budget too, and they can't have a lot of wastage or it's not efficient for them. But thanks for your question, that was a great question. Hi, I, I actually have two questions, um, well, kind of unrelated. First one is, with the iPad initiative, will that mean that we won't have to buy some of the textbooks? Yes, actually, that's correct. Thank okay. you. That's a good question. And, and I'm, I'm going to tell you as honestly as I can, we are going to work as hard as we can to plan this as well as we can. We, may, we had some hiccups in the rollout with the pilot program, and I imagine there will probably, despite our best efforts, be some hicc hiccups in the fall. But the long-term vision, not the short-term vision, the long-term vision is that course materials, which historically have been textbooks, will become much more of the electronic type, either an app or some online materials that can be viewed using the technology of the iPad. If we, all, we all know when you look at what publishers are doing, the cost of content has dropped dramatically, but 
but producers of the public, the publishers are reluctant to go the, to the, the, as much as they say they're trying to get there, they're pretty slow in getting there because they know their margins are much lower, okay? But, but that's where the game is. Many, many, I, mean, I should say many, many public school districts are going to iPads. And so we feel that there's gonna be a robust source of um, content out there for our kids to get, to get the material. I'm, I've thought this through from about 17 different angles. If you're the kind of parents who always have a friend on the, in the grade ahead or a sibling in the grade ahead, let's face it, you buy the book once and then you actually don't really buy anything the next year, right? So I'm, I'm mindful that some people are not paying very much at all, even though we might say the listed price for fifth grade is $312 or $242. The faculty have been tasked with the idea of finding really good content that is effective in teaching the course the way it ought to be taught, consistent with our curriculum guide, and do that at the lowest cost possible so that over time um, we would be without any textbooks. I don't think that's uh, going to be any time in the next few years because I think it'll be a transition. We don't, we don't think um, that the total cost of either procuring one time the iPad or renting the iPad, whichever way you choose, financing it, um, should be more than the cost of the textbooks would have been if we just purchased textbooks. That's the goal. And um, I, I can't give you a definitive answer what's it going to cost for seventh grade next year. But that's the goal. And there will be some apps. Uh, Mr. Howard, you here? Right there you go. Okay. Uh, there will be some apps that are sort of almost like operating systems, common apps for the school, e-backpack, uh, Dropbox, things like that, that every student in the school will need to use just to be part of the school system. Um, and we're going to try hard to make those something that families don't have to procure because we want to make sure everybody has it. But when we get to the stuff that says you're in, you're in uh, Spanish three, this is the curriculum. You need to get this material for your course. That'll be the parent's responsibility. And we're gonna set that up in as the most efficient way we can. And uh, we anticipate actually if we can, again, I hate standing up in this meeting and making a promise I can't keep, but I really think it'll help us a lot if we have a few workshops before school starts and certainly a little bit after school starts next year with parents and or kids or some combination of the two. But does that answer your question? I mean, that's the goal. And I think initially it won't be quite as efficient because some of, the, some of us will still be buying textbooks while we still have the iPad. You know, one thing I haven't talked about, and I hope we all appreciate this, is the less hard textbooks we have to carry in these backpacks will save these kids' backs. I mean, I don't remember having that much stuff when I was in high school, you know, and it's just kind of ridiculous how much some of these little guys are carrying around. What's your next question? The second question has to do with, um, I guess, the upper school curriculum. Is there any um, chance that you will be increasing maybe... Like AP classes? Uh, I'm just curious as to why. And I asked Mr. Cox this why there is no AP chemistry. Right. Whereas there's AP physics. Yes, it's a fair question. Um, I, I'll be honest on that answer. Uh, the, I would love to do that. Um, some of this is the, the, uh, the inefficiencies of being a really small school. Um, you have to staff these things and you have to have enough kids to take them. And so um, to the, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the AP for our kids. And to the extent that we can do that over time, um, I also would never, I would never make the decision to, uh, to actually offer a course that I didn't think we had a qualified instructor to deliver the goods. And we're not staffed right now to do that. And so, um, but I, I am always looking for ways that we can enhance the AP program because it's really our flagship in terms of what do we tout? You saw the statistics, we're really proud of them. And to the extent that we can take the very top tier of kids, those who want it and are capable of doing well at it, um, we want to be able to do that. And um, I don't think AP chemistry is the only one that I would say is kind of missing, if I were being honest with you. Thank you. Yeah. Being small is a wonderful thing. There are some disadvantages. Hey, kudos um, to Ms. Franzoni, who, did I see her? She's right there. Um, to the after school program. It is, it's, at least for my kids and everything, it's fantastic. And it's, oh, I'm glad you feel it that just, way. To me, it just elevates the school that much more to have all those after school programs that are available. I, I think they're just awesome. So. Well, thank you for saying that. I'm really I'm glad to hear it. Ms. Franzoni's worked incredibly well. She's incredibly well organized. And uh, it was really the, the forceful uh, direction of uh, Mrs. Cawthon saying, Ed, we have to do this. We have to do this. I said, well, what are we going to do? And so she came up with these plans. In fact, Mrs. Morgan, I don't know if Martha's here. Is Martha here tonight? Mrs. Morgan. Mrs. Morgan was really the catalyst to get it going last year. And then all of a sudden, it became so uh, fruitful that she was overwhelmed by the responsibility. And so I was really grateful that when we had a little bit of a blip in staffing, that we were able to free up some time and have uh, Christine willing to jump in and do a terrific job. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Um, the Singapore math, have, have you seen the results of instituting that new curriculum and you know, have the test scores shown that that has been a good change for the school or is it too early still? I think it's still too early, but if you get some data that you could share, Mary Helen, or not. If, if, yeah. Um, it really is, Kim, a little too early yet um, to tell. In comparison, you know, we are the problem solving portion of the SAT 10, which is what the children in first through fifth take, actually were elevated this year. Now, whether it was because of that, time will tell. I can also say, you there? I can also say to you that the current first grade scores were significantly elevated. Um, the kindergarten was the first year last year that were exposed to Singapore math. Now, whether it's just because the current first graders are extremely right. high math achievers, again, time will tell. I would, you know, I would really give it about three years for us to really tell, but I will say the problem solving um, was elevated and I was very impressed with the first grade scores. Yeah, it's really interesting in a school of our size, when you look at a class of 40 to 60 students, it's really easy to look at one set of data and get and imagine it's indicative of something. You know, we talked about the SAT scores of last year's group of seniors, and it's really interesting because Mr. Cox and I looked at that, and, and, and I was taken aback that there was, you know, what appeared to be a pretty significant drop. And then I said, you know, I, I started doing my own sort of negative speculating, saying, well, maybe, maybe as a result of the recession, we took in some students who weren't as able, and that's what's caused the scores to drop. And so if you look at last year's graduating class, and Mary Virginia will correct me, or Mary Helen will correct me, but I think there were 16 students in that class who started in pre-K, and another 11 who started in kindergarten. So almost half of the class was there the whole way. And I started going kind of name by name, thinking like, oh, it's gonna be all the kids who came in the last four years that got the low scores, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> we carried them for 12 years, you know? So I wouldn't say, I, I would say it was a cohort that went through. And I think what you're saying is, hey, we're encouraged by the data, but it's way too early to tell. But we're going to continue to do that. And we're also going to be talking, maybe it's too early to talk about test SAT-9 versus other possible testing that we could be doing as well. But that's a, that is, that is something yeah, we're, we're looking at actually looking for a little bit more rigorous testing, to be honest with you, in terms of our satisfaction with the current testing we're using. Our kids do incredibly well on it, and we don't think it gives us enough distinction or enough data to really discern you know, to give ourselves feedback for the curriculum. We want the curriculum to be as good as it can be. And if you're, if you're giving yourself a test that says, hey, you're all really good, you know, what does that tell you? And I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but it's a concern. The other tests that we think are possibly better substitutes are much more expensive, and so we gotta, we gotta figure out a way to fund that if we're gonna do it. Well, the second, the second meeting is gonna start in another 10 minutes. I understand the matinee will be great. If that's all, I've got eight after, I've got eight after eight, and I really, on such a crummy night, I'm really grateful for those of you who turned out. Uh, if uh, you have any friends at home who missed it, I believe we've, we're gonna find out in a few minutes if we get a solid recording of this, and we'll try to make at least the, uh, the portions where I'm not speaking in gibberish uh, available for people to look at. Thank you again for coming tonight, and uh, I'm really grateful for your support uh, and your great questions tonight. And by the way, we do have an open door policy, so if there's something else on your mind, please don't hesitate to set up a meeting and come by and see one of us uh, about anything at any time. We love your kids. Thank you for sending them to St. John's.